Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have one of the legends of technology and business, Nolan Bushnell. Nolan founded both Atari and Chuck E. Cheese Pizza. He's been inducted into the Video Game Hall of Fame and was named one of Newsweek's 50 Men Who Changed America. He started more than 20 companies and is one of the founding fathers of the video game industry. His latest venture is called Brain Rush that uses video game technology that incorporates real brain science. He hired Steve Jobs back in the Atari days and is the author of Finding the Next Steve Jobs, How to Find, Keep, and Nurture Talent. Nolan, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Good fun to be here. You know, I listened to that a few times before we talked and... It's a must listen to. I listen to a must read. And I want to ask a few questions about that. And um, I'm not going to, I don't think we should divulge the answer, but one of my favorite parts were the riddles that you include in there. <laughs> one of, and anything that starts with three women in a bathing suit. And I don't think we should reveal what the riddle is. People will have to read it or listen to it to find out what that riddle is. But, but that, that is, is a good one. Book. Yeah, that is a good one. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I want to I want to hear about you know obviously talk about the Atari days the Chuck E Cheese days I want to hear about recently or lately so I want to know what your favorite game you ever produced past and then present at Brain Rush. Um, the I, I guess the the game templates Brain Rush is more about a template that can can teach anything. Yeah. And I did a game called that the template that is called sequences, where any time the order of something is important, that is the template to use. And it turns out that m a tremendous amount of education is about what what's the order, grammar, uh, even spelling, mm -hmm. uh, chemistry, a lot of physics, m tremendous amount of mathematics is ordering objects and and sets. And so I felt that was kind of a neat thing to have a general purpose tool mm -hmm. that would uh, allow that kind of learning. Yeah. So what about past, your favorite past games that you've produced? I think I think I really was happy with Breakout. And that happened to be the one that Steve Jobs did with me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I did, I did the primary architecture and uh, Steve and... Uh, Jobs and Wozniak basically did the articulation on the, on the hardware. Mm -hmm. So tell us, what was it like working with the two of them on that project? Oh, great fun. Steve was always a, a real giggle. Um, you know, Steve was one of these guys, if, if, you, if he liked you, there was no one more charming, mm -hmm. no, no one more fun. Um, Wozniak at the time was very, very shy. You know, if I'd ask him a question, he'd just stare at his feet. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, but Jobs and I became uh, kind of uh, a friend. I mean, Isaacson's book uh, told me that he that Jobs considered me one of his big mentors. Yeah, I hadn't actually realized it before the book. Oh, really? I just kind of thought we were friends and we hung out. <laughs> uh, but you know, I. As my wife says, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm really clueless when it comes to picking up social codes. <laughs> <laughs> she loves you, anyways. Um, so, yeah. but you, what was it like when you first met Steve? Because you hired him. I actually didn't. Um, uh, uh, Al Alcorn, my head of engineering, mm. hired, but he made himself aware to me very quickly, and and I was always in the engineering lab, and so. Mm -hmm. You know, he came into my office one time with the grandiose plan, and you know, we we developed friendship. Did you know at that time that he would become what what people know him today? Of course not. No, <laughs> no. I I thought he was an extraordinary human being. Yeah. I always thought he was a little bit. I don't know. I, I didn't feel like he had the common sense to be a good CEO. 
And I think that was as much to the fact that he was 19 and 20 years old. Sure, as yeah. It was anything else. Nobody has common sense at 20. Uh, but more than that, um, I mean, I clearly didn't see it. Otherwise, I would have taken him up when I was offered a third of Apple computer for $50,000, which I turned down. I read I, about that. I regret that. <laughs> Why did you turn it down at the time? Because you, you would have owned a third of Apple. Yeah. I mean, we'd have been diluted. I wouldn't have been right. at it now. But the, um, I think it it was two or three reasons. One, I wasn't sure that he was a, a great bu businessman at the time. Second, I know that we were at Atari starting to think about doing a personal computer at the time, and I thought there would be a conflict of interest. I see. Yeah. So I always like to include a fun fact. And a fun fact about you, Owen, is... I mean, there's a number of them. You like puns. You go snowboarding, but you have eight kids. So, That's true. yeah, can you tell us a little bit about raising eight kids and how you incorporate the entrepreneurship spirit in them? We were a family of projects. We yeah. were always working on things, and I gave kids my kids access to. I had a little metal shop and a little, uh, you know, uh, carpentry shop. I'd let them do anything that they couldn't cut their fingers off on. Right. I had to be there if they could cut their fingers off. Yeah. Uh, we had an electronics lab, and uh, and then off in the corner of that, there was a, a chemistry set uh, setup. So that uh, I mean, this was serious stuff: Bunsen burners and and yeah. reports and and diffraction grading, uh, diffraction uh, elements, and, you know. And so all the kids grew up knowing how to use those tools. And kids don't know the difference between toys and lab equipment. It's toys and, to them, yeah. And so it they they always thought that it was fun to go up in dad's lab and make stuff. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, blow stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure your wife loved that. Um, Not too much. No. <laughs> so you grew up in Utah. What were some of the entrepreneur projects you had from a young age? Well, I was a ham radio operator, and I started very young. Uh, and, um, you know, I wired up uh, all my friend's house with a, uh, with a wired telephone system that I, that I created mm -hmm. using speakers and wires and batteries and stuff like that. Um, I had probably the first speakerphone in Utah. I mean, that I, you know, my mom was always afraid because in those days you weren't allowed to even put your own extension, you know, unless it was there. Of course, I figured out how the how the phone company could track it, and so I disconnected the ringer because they they could tech, test the ringer, and if there was too much impedance, they knew you had an extension. So I had three extensions in my room. That's funny. And, uh, but to give you an idea how crazy it was in those days, my friends had all come over, and since nobody knew about a speakerphone, one of us would get the guy's girlfriend on the phone and talk. And <laughs> I knew the girls thing. would be involved, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so that was all kind of cool. Oh, one thing that I did, I covered my ceiling with burnt out fluorescent lights that I got down behind the grocery store. Okay. I mean, literally covered the ceiling. Sounds dangerous, but go ahead, yes. Well, what you do is is you wire them all in series, and then you ground one end, and then you hook your other end up to your big long wiring antenna. Mm -hmm. As soon as you have a lightning storm, your whole ceiling oh flashes my God. every time, it's just with the 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 induced electricity. Jeez, I, that's cool. That's that? pretty cool. Yeah. What were the lessons you learned from your parents? Because obviously, you had this inventive, entrepreneurial nature from a young age. Well, my dad was a contractor, and so we always had, you know, the wood pile and tools, and and I had a very rich environment of tools. I mean, mm -hmm. we weren't rich; we were just middle class. He was a cement contractor, and my mother was a school teacher. But you know, later on, when he did his own business, my mom would mm -hmm. kept the books, and you know, it was a family business. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the the main thing was that. It wasn't so much learning from them as much as the fact they tolerated my eccentricities. I mean, how many parents would allow you their their twelve year old to 
put a red and white striped pole on the top of their house with a with a flashing red light on top for an antenna pole. I mean, you know, there's not a lot. Of not things. many. No. Not many. You know. And so I think I, I'm looking back on that and I'm saying, yeah. you know, my parents were really cool. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So what did the early days look like of your career? Because I was reading, one of the big things I surprised that surprised me with the research was that you were towards the bottom of your class, which I would not have expected. Well, I, I always took school a little bit with a grain of salt. Yeah. I was more interested in what I wanted to learn rather than getting the particular grades yeah like a lot of this a lot of the classes i thought were stupid yeah <laughs> and uh, and a lot of times i'd get interested in something and i would be sitting in a classroom that, for which i wasn't signed up for instead of going to the one that i yeah. was signed up for and just yeah. stuff like that yeah plus i always put myself through school um and so i worked very much you know when i became manager of the uh games department at the amusement park yeah my spring quarter was really i had to be there probably 50 hours a week and so that would uh, tend to cut in, in yeah cuts into your schools yeah so stuff. then what were what were you doing right before atari before you started atari uh i was well there's two phases i I graduated in college, mm -hmm. came to Ampex, which was a pretty cool company at the time. First, you know, they invented slow motion video, the first videotape recorder. Um, and then I, then I worked on uh, this thing called Space War, which turned into computer space and licensed it to Nutting. So I went from Ampex to Nutting. And then Nutting was kind of a screwed up little company and... Uh, and that gave me the confidence to go out on my own and start Atari. Yeah. I remember hearing you say, seeing the people running it and it was successful, that you could, you know, that uh, you didn't call them not smart, but that you saw these people running it and you could do it too. Was that one aspect that you saw that made you kind of launch out on your own? Absolutely. I mean, they were not just not smart. They were buffoons, <laughs> you know. And and when you know say gee you know they've got a company and they they're doing everything wrong and yet yeah. they're still making payroll and doing all this stuff so I think that that in Silicon Valley one of the the corporate one of sort of the Silicon Valley Valley cultures is almost everyone who's worked there has sat next to somebody who went off on their own and did well yeah. and I said gee I know that guy he's not any smarter than I am I can right. do that. Right. And I like to say, you know, Nutting was, was I thought they were buffoons. Jobs obviously, obviously left me. He must have thought I was a buffoon. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, 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 you know, it's karma. Well, it he all, has you yeah. as a mentor. He considered you a mentor and you didn't consider the other people mentors. So a little bit different. But yeah. um, so what were, what was the early days of Atari like? What did you do first when you got it started? Well, the, the, the thing that people don't understand is that there was no real venture capital for us at the time. Yeah. So we, it, so every day was a scramble for cash. And uh, we were able to finance Atari by building, um, building product with parts that we got on 30, 60, 90 day terms turning it into a product really, really fast and selling it for cash. Right. And so we had cash for the product plus the margin long before we had to pay our bills. Mm -hmm. And so we funded the company on accounts payable. And, uh, and um, you know, we invented just-in-time inventory before it had been named. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you still have to produce things that people wanted what was that creative process like when you were creating those things for these companies that you were selling well the 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 real creative process then was strict was was heavily bounded by what we could do yeah the technology was very difficult to, and it didn't have really extremely high resolution and uh 
the the screens could not be busy. They couldn't have a lot of elements to them. And so we would constantly try to figure out the creativity was what can we do given the limit, limitations that we have. Right. And then and then dot 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 how can we remove some of those limitations with better technology? Mm -hmm. And so we were kind of pushing both threads all yeah. the time. Yeah. So how did you originally meet um, Al Alcorn? Al Alcorn worked for me at Ampex. Oh, okay. He was, he was on a work study program with uh, with uh, Berkeley, and he was an engineer at Berkeley, and they had a uh, thing where uh, you'd work in industry for six months, then you go back to school for six months. Mm -hmm. And just to add that, Steve Bristow, who was the other big, uh, you know, name in Atari, was, was the other half of him. So he would be my, my tech for six months, and then Bristow would be my tech for six months. Mm -hmm. And they ended up being vice president of research, vice president of, of uh, engineering for Atari, mm -hmm. and were brilliant guys, both of them. Yeah. So, Nolan, how fast, you know, Atari grew super fast. How fast did it actually grow? Went from, uh, well, you know, it grew super fast in those days. You know, in the internet days, I think we've been succeeded many times. I'm sure, yeah. But uh, we basically went from uh, a stub year of three and a half million to 19 million to mm -hmm. 38 million to 104 million. Wow. And with that, you have to hire tons of people. How do you, yes. man how do you manage that? That growth with people. We um, we really hired almost anybody we could, and then we'd fire the bad ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we called it rotating to excellence, and uh, and you know we'd give everybody a chance uh, that we we could because there are some people who are really good, uh, who are really good employees, but really horrible interviewers. And, uh, right, right, yes. And the other part about it is we didn't care about degrees. You know, if you're smart enough, that would be good. The, yeah. One of the prime uh, designers of the Atari 2600 was a high school dropout. And, you know, like companies like Google and Facebook and those are now just catching on. They don't even ask if somebody's had a college degree. Mm -hmm. They're just looking for what the person could do. Yeah. And you had an innovative way of looking at culture. Can you tell people a little bit about the culture at Atari and what you did? Well, it was really about a meritocracy. And that uh, I said, we are going to focus strictly on outcomes, not process. Yeah. And so you can, you can wear what you want. You can come to work when you want. You don't even have to come to work. Just get your your project done and I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then we'd jump through hoops to make sure that people were happy. And then we'd have, then we'd celebrate. We, we had the Friday afternoon beer bus on the loading dock and they were just, you know, that was, that was the reward. And we partied a lot because, you know, everybody hit quota. <laughs> You know, how do you, you know, you've strong, in your book, you talk about it too, you have strong personalities like Steve Jobs and, and other people. How did you, you know, manage that with all the other employees? Well, whenever you have, not everyone, not everyone is a social being. There's a lot of people that are abrasive, you know, have bad you know, social habits, bad, bad social skills. And yet if they're capable people, you want them on your team. So I would cloister them. I'd, I'd figure out, a, you know, another building, a, a back room, you know, in the basement. Right. Uh, it, in Steve Jobs case, we, I created an a engineering night shift, which previously didn't exist. And so he was the only one on the engineering night shift, but there was a, I was being a little tricky because I felt that, uh, you know, I knew that he and Waz hung out and Waz was a savant. You know, you, you could tell that a minute, you know, immediately. He really understood t 
technology of the time like no other. And I knew that Waz would work at Hewlett Packard and then come and hang out with, with Jobs at night. So I thought I was getting two Steves for the price of one. Right, yeah. <laughs> so did he officially work there also? Or was he just no. there? No, he didn't. He didn't. <laughs> well, so you really did get two for the price of one. Um, <laughs> so what, what, what made you decide at the end to, to sell Atari? I was tired. Like I said, we were constantly chasing cash. I, I've often thought that if I'd have just taken a two-week vacation, I wouldn't have sold. But it was just getting difficult. And then, you know, I was a farm boy from Utah. And all of a sudden, I could sell and have more cash than I ever thought I'd have ever in my life. Right. And, you know, you say sometimes you hold them, sometimes you fold them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what happened after you sold? With Atari, and I want to talk about Chuck E. Cheese a little bit too, but I know that Warner Warner Brothers bought it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they they really were monofocused in a lot of ways, and uh, and I hadn't realized that when I sold them, but they really didn't care that much about the coin-op business. They really didn't understand it that well, and they didn't understand technology. They thought they were in the record business, hmm. and that the cartridges were the record of the future. And it had record kind of margins, it had record kind of marketing mm -hmm. programs, what have you. And they didn't realize that while it took 40 years to replace the 78 RPM with the 33 and then another 20 years to, or 45 and then another 20 years to get the 33 RPM record and then that, that the game technology was moving so quickly that they really needed to upgrade the hardware mm. on a much bigger standard than they did. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they just didn't, that just didn't grok to them. Yeah. And remember, Atar uh, Chuck E. Cheese was started inside Atari and they didn't want it. And so I bought it personally. So they did me a big favor that way. Mm -hmm. So what are big mistakes people do make with, video game companies that you maybe have made or that you've seen these other companies make? Because obviously you had a thriving company and a, you know, you'd think a big company like Warner Brothers would have the wherewithal to make it launch further. They didn't understand enough about the technology to understand that they had, Atari didn't, it, it, usually companies uh, get killed by competitors. Yeah. Atari got killed by a total un lack of understanding and hiring people that didn't understand games, didn't even play games themselves. And so there was no resonance with the business. And mm -hmm. when it crashed in 83, their ego said, oh, the business must have crashed. It wasn't us. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't us because we're what, <laughs> obviously we're the smartest guys in the room. You know, and and so therefore, but when but what what can we do when the business just goes away? Yeah, and, and what they really did, they saturated the business with twenty six hundred. They tried a couple of feeble attempts at upgrading it, but it was the wrong product, and there was a lot of confusion in the market because the Atari was the leader, and all of a sudden they were in disarray, and there was the the winter of discontent in eighty three where everybody thought the business had gone away. Yeah. And then Nintendo came back and said, no, it hasn't. <laughs> right. So, Nolan, after you sell, what was that like? Like you said, you're a farm boy from Utah, and then you build up this company, huge growth, and then you sell. It was delightful. I mean, I bought a 15,000-square-foot house in Woodside, fixed it up, and... Uh, and started looking for a wife and found one <laughs> and filled the house with kids. <laughs> <laughs> you you truly did that. So what was the beginnings of Chuck E. Cheese? After you, you bought you bought it from them, right? Or like a pizza yeah, I chain? I started it inside Atari. Yeah. And, and the idea was our coin-op games, we were selling them at the time for about $2,000. But during their life, they'd take thirty dollars to $50,000 in coin drop. So it didn't take a rocket science to say right. we're on the wrong side of this equation. Right. But I didn't want to compete with my customers. So I said, I'm just going to create my own venue 
where I would, I'll have a place for young kids. The, the other issue was, it was a marketing issue that we knew that young kids had a high uh, desire to play video games, but there was no appropriate venue for them. Yeah. Video games weren't really in in uh, restaurants at the time. They were sort of in bowling alleys and bars. Yeah. Neither of which were the appropriate thing for for an eight year old kid. <laughs> no. And so, created a family entertainment center, filled it full of video games and kitty rides and pizza. Yeah. And it worked like a charm. I like the um. What was tell me what the original name that you that you thought was good. Coyote Pizza. Yeah, Coyote. but after that, there was another name after Coyote Pizza. With Rat in it? Rat, or Rick Rat's Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wasn't... Uh, everybody was horrified with that one. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of the challenges with Chuck E. Cheese? Obviously, it's a household name. Uh, I think... Um, I mean, there were... Compared to Atari, Chuck E. Cheese was, was pretty easy. Um, the challenges were learning how to to manage big geographic di diversities. Di you know, I used to say when you're chairman of a of a multi chain restaurant, it's like the kid in the back seat with his little steering wheel. He's driving, he's driving, he's driving. It's not connected to the wheels. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it feels like when you're CEO of a, of a thing. How, how do you drive yeah. and have it connect to the wheels when it's in Omaha? Right. And, and, that, and, and, you feel, and you realize quickly that the linkages between command and control and the, the units in the field is yeah. very, very loose and very wobbly. Yeah. yeah. So how did you do it? Because I could see like Atari and Chuck E. Cheese are they were local, much different. Much, much different. Well, we, um, you know, I would wish that we'd had Skype in those days. We'd have conference calls, and that was a help. But in those days, conference calls were expensive. You know, I, I can remember having a conference call that cost the company almost uh, 800 bucks. Wow. You know? Just <laughs> as much as getting on a plane and yeah. going over there. Well, no, it was multiple people, though. You yeah. know, it was, a, it, was a it, was, it was a conference. But, you know, it, it's funny to think about how, how things that we take advantage of, that were clear as, 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 uh, as free, uh, are now... You know, right? We take it for cool. granted the technology for granted. It seems like yeah. you're ahead of the curve on all these technologies. Yeah, if you I'm have to sorry. get that. Go ahead. You know, I'm going to just unplug the phone. Oh no, I'll just do DND. I forgot about that. There we go. So the um, with Chuck E. Cheese, when you look back in Atari, you look back. What were what was a couple big lessons that you learned that you bring to to Brain Rush? Well, I think that um, the the main thing I try to learn is that uh, how do you how do you market into new places? And schools are probably the most uh, noisy environments or frictioned environments to sell because highly bureaucratic. Um, they really uh, are afraid of making mistakes. Uh, they're very backward thinking, not forward thinking. Right. In general, you're you're looking at the most innovation avoiding segment of the population that you yeah. could, and uh, and so it's represented a very big new challenge to me because usually, if you have a product that's the best in the market, it just flies off the shelf. Right. Not only now you have to you you not only have to have a, a great product, but you have to bribe people and, <laughs> and you know jump through hoops and and you I could I could spend my whole life speaking at education conferences, 
that are full of people who are educators, not a decision maker in the plot in the yeah. place. Yeah. Not one. <laughs> yeah. So how do you get traction with Brain Rush? Because that is the market, right? Yeah, that's the market. You just keep plugging at it and slowly you you get some help. One of the things that's slowing it now is schools are really having trouble getting the technology right and deploying tablets or, or Chromebooks. Mm, mm -hmm. um, for example, you get a, a great big, you know, 20 gigabyte, gigabit pipe into the school. And then three kids start streaming and they shut the whole thing down. Right. So how do you keep the kids from streaming on that? You know, that, 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 yeah. that. And it's just, you know, there's a few things that don't get mentioned a lot in the interviews that I want to ask you about is, um, Kadabra scope. Ah, yeah. Tell me about that. That I read that it sold to Lucas and was sort of the beginnings of Pixar. That's correct. Well, I had this idea that, that computers were going to take the drudgery out of, um, animation. Mm-hmm. And so we bought a at Chuck E. Cheese. We did. We bought a PDP seven hundred and fifty. I think it was seven hundred and eighty. And it was it was a pretty hot scientific computer at the time. And we bought some core software from uh, New York University because they had a little project on computer assisted animation. And uh, and we worked on it for uh, um, probably close to two years and got to really understand what it was. And one of the things we realized is that to do graphics at the time was so computer intensive yeah. that even though we had a, a very hot computer at the time, it was not nearly hot enough. Like a, yeah. a lot of times we were, it was taking us uh, 12 to 15 hours to render a single frame. Wow. You know, and you say, oh, yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's not. So do good. people have it too easy these days then? Like you compare those days to people today and the people today maybe are complaining about certain things. Do we have it well, too easy now? <laughs> you know, I'm sure that there will be uh, people um, that, you know, no, I, I mean, People have it a lot easier. They can do things now. The mm -hmm. number of MIPS. I mean, we. I didn't foresee that we'd have gigabit, uh, gigahertz yeah. processors. That yeah. just seemed too fast. It seemed like there were some speed of light things uh, in the problem. There's no question to me that we're going to have quantum computing that's going to make our current things look slow. Yeah. Uh, I want to hear what you think is next on the horizon because it almost always seems like. You're too far ahead of yourself. Is that why you end up selling that with the the cadaverscope? You were just too far ahead. I, I I was I was too far ahead for the amount of cash and time that I had. Yeah. I realized that it was one of those things that was going to take a lot of cash and a lot of time yeah. before it could be profitable. And I didn't feel like it was an appropriate thing for Chuck E. Cheese to do at yeah. the time. Yeah. Yeah. I want to hear about what you think is next, but another kind of too far ahead of yourself, you had a catalyst incubator. Correct. What were some of the cool things that came out of catalyst? And I think without you, my wife and I could not get around because we have horrible <laughs> senses of direction and, and you had something called ETAC. ETAC was the first automobile navigation company. And, uh, and when was that? What, what, what time frame? what, uh, what era are we looking at? Three was when it started. Yeah. And, uh, we ended up, in fact, if you use Google Maps or anything, it's all using our core software right? Um, that, that we licensed. But uh, we did that. We did one called um, Buy Video, which was probably the first online shopping, uh, even though there were kiosks in airports and things that you could order uh, on the screen, mm -hmm. and uh, the order would be sent in by modem. <laughs> Twelve hundred baud modem. <laughs> so it was it was not online, but it was kind of close to being online. Yeah, we did a uh, 
we came very close to creating a chip that would allow for a, well, we, we thought at the time we could do a 50 cent video screen using a, a, a liquid crystal projection technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and we got it working on a small scale and then, uh, and then we just decided that to get it from there into the market was going to be too much, so we kind of shut that down. Mm -hmm. Then I did Anderbot, and Anderbot was, boy, that was a big problem because I fell in love with it. I just knew there had to be a robot, and we sold a lot of them. And Why was it a problem? Because the, the unit that we w thought was going to make the breakthrough, we just could not get it to be reliable. And, uh, you know, a 50 pound robot rolling down the stairway <laughs> to somebody crushing but, them. Yeah. And crushing them was not a good idea. And, and, and there were a lot of things that would cause the computer to crash, uh, technically, um, uh, if you were rolling around on a carpet, you'd pick up static electricity, the static would mm. uh, jump across the bearings of the wheels that would be enough EMF to to shut down the computer, to, mm. to crash the computer. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and uh, we tried putting the whole, um, the whole computer in a Gaussian enclosure and a Faraday cage and all that just could not. The noise immunity of chips now can handle it. The noise immunity of the chips in those days just couldn't. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. So what were some of the big lessons? Was that one of the first incubators? I think so. Well, the, the big lesson with an incubator is you should have a two year and out philosophy that um, uh, there is no startup that cannot be fixed with a little bit more money. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, the walking wounded, you can't always tell whether it's the wrong market, the wrong team, yeah. the wrong product. And so after a while, all the good companies have moved out and all you've got left with are these walking wounded. It's kind of like, you know, the day of the incubator zombie. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> so Nolan, what's next? What should people start thinking about or looking at? Cause it's, you know, what's next in the horizon? For me or for the Yeah, world? for you and for the world, yeah. Oh, I think um, I'm going to be doing a new kind of, uh, of amusement park. I'm going to call it a micro amusement park. Uh, think of a, uh, of a Sears Roebuck that's gone out of business and it's at the end and there's all this square footage that's available. And think of it just full of, uh, of Bushnell crazy stuff. That's Wait, does that include sun as well? Oh yeah, Brent too. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I've got I've got five sons that are involved in some level of technology. Oh really? My okay. Daughters as well, so it'll basically be uh, mentored by my uh, uh, my second daughter. It's the PR is going to be handled by my first daughter. All the money we make is going to be handled by my third daughter. <laughs> And, and the tech is going to be from the boys. So what's next for the world? Because it seems like you're always one step ahead with Atari, you know, the, the robots, Pixar, E-Tech. You know, what's, what's next that people should be looking at? I think, um, I think robots are going to be very, very important. You know, people have talked about them. But when I say robots, I'm saying little guys that are rolling around your house and, and doing stuff for you. Mm -hmm. You know? that become a member of your family. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think that, uh, probably the biggest social impact will be the auto drive cars. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just, it's just around the corner and, uh, you know, the Autobahn, no just, pun intended. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Autobahn just, uh, made them legal. So now you can have pilotless cars mm -hmm. and trucks on the Autobahn and you, mm -hmm. and, uh, Nevada has said that they're legal. Yeah. Uh, I think the sharing economy 
is going to continue to pick up speed. You know, Uber, um, Lyft, uh, Airbnb. I think those things change an awful lot of existing structures. Mm -hmm. But the real impact on life will be the auto drive car because it'll get rid of congestion. Uh, you'll be able to get home hammered. Uh, <laughs> if, they, if, they're, if they're at one of your parties, that's important. You know? right. So, you know, Nolan, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask about the lowest point and how you got through those tough times. Because people just see you now after, you know, being the father of video games, Atari, Chuck E. Cheese. It, it wasn't always an easy journey. What was the lowest point? And then how you pushed through? I think the lowest point was when I was, um, I did some personal guarantees and I uh, was basically underwater financially. Uh, and, uh, and I ended up having to sell the Woodside house. And I had all these kids and everything. And, Scary. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I wasn't destitute, but it was a, it, but it was a thing where I, the kids were, you know, between four and and twenty, and uh, and I, I was concerned about their lives actually more than mine because yeah. uh, you know going from living in this sixteen thousand square foot mansion with a water slide and uh, you know a lot of goodies to a rental in Palo Alto wasn't going to work right and so I decided I was going to take everybody on the long awaited trip to Europe for a year and we could do it very cheaply because I had friends all over the world that had always said oh come come and stay and so we we spent uh, four months in London and a month in in Scandinavia. Now, that doesn't sound like a low point. <laughs> but just before that, before yeah. we made that decision, it was pretty it was yeah. pretty bleak. The year yeah. before was really bad because we were struggling and you know, we the house went into foreclosure a couple of times and you know, that was bleak. That is scary. Yeah. But you know, I hate to say this, but it's it was it was all an illusion. We didn't. Re we did. We we thought we had problems, but we, the family was healthy. We were all together, yeah. you know. Uh, the and 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 the Woodside House, in the broad scheme of things, didn't matter. Right. You know. Yeah. And 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 so, so I think a lot of times you just have to get your head wrapped around what what are the important things in life and what yeah. are the not important yeah. things. Just having your kids safe and healthy was the. What you yeah. focused on. It was important. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the flip side of that, Nolan, what's been the proudest moment? One of the proudest moments? Oh, wow. That's a real hard one. I, I don't know. I. You could choose a few. What? You could choose a few if there's not just one. I, you know, it's actually not the way my brain works. Like, I can think about what will be my proudest moment when I do certain things, and you know, my goals. But the stuff that I've accomplished, it's kind of, okay, yeah, done that, done mm -hmm. that. You know, I, I really we'll enjoy do both of those. What was one um, accomplishment you had that you were, you had that goal and you had it set and you finally hit it? And then what's the next? The I won next the goal? trans pack in 1983. What was that? I won the trans pack. I, it was ah. the, it was the, it was a, you know, a sailing race, uh, San, uh, Los Angeles to Hawaii, and uh, and I and I won that puppy. And two years before, I went on the race just kind of as a participant. And then, uh, and then I then I when I was out in the middle of the Pacific, I said, you know, in two years I'm going to win this puppy. Yeah, and I did. <laughs> Any business related ones that you had your sights set on? Well, hitting uh, hitting two hundred and fifty Chuck E. Cheeses was one. Yeah. Um, you know, selling. You know, gosh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. What, I, what's I, next? You said you have you have big goals still. Oh, I I really want to. 
positively change education. I think that our education is totally mismatched with today's technology. I mean, our kids are so much brighter. They have so much more multitasking ability, batch processed. The classroom should be abolished. There should be no classes. There should be no, the concept of grades is wrong. There should be no grades and no grades. People should enter school, travel at their own speed, focus on their own interests, and and quit when they want to to get a job. <laughs> yeah. You know, or, or move into apprenticeships. It should be, there shouldn't be this broad link between somebody who's in school and somebody yeah. who's working because yeah. we need to be lifelong learners right. as well. And so I think life needs to be more of an amalgam of, of the educational yeah. self and, and that. And, and, and I believe that there's so many ways you can learn that you don't want to have it be um, so stilted and, yeah. and pedantic. Yeah, I like that. And for, for someone with kids, anyone with kids, where should someone start? You know, because they are in this system. Where should, where should someone start with that? I know. And, and you know, and it's hard. Um, Besides I, Brain it, Rush, where else? Yeah, yeah. Brain Rush and, yeah. and, and a lot of the other stuff. What, um, but, you know, so the, the biggest thing, there are hours and hours and hours of boredom in a classroom. Because, you know, lecture is just the wrong way to do to to give information. Right, yeah. And and what what is being crushed is enthusiasm for learning. Yeah. You know, kids don't know the difference between learning and school. They think they're the same. No, they're not. School is boring, learning is fun. Right. <laughs> and and uh, and you really want to have these other constructs developed. I mean, creativity if you look at all the statistics, we're training creativity out yeah. of people, right? Um, and uh, and it's just uh, anyway. I could go on. And yeah, on. It's puppy. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, that's what I'm wondering. Where should someone, someone should start? Like, let's so you have kids; they're just entering school, or they're already in school. Where where should people start? Because they're in the system. So, how do you get them on track? I would be less worried about the system in some ways. I took the kids out of school when we went to Europe. Yeah. Homeschool. Yeah. And you know, using the museums around the world as sort of a background. Yeah. You know, what better way to learn about World War One and World War Two than the British War Museum? Right. What better way to learn about physics than going through the the Science and Industry Museum? Sure. And uh Yeah. You know what better? What I mean, and some of the the museums and that in uh, in Scandinavia and yeah. in Germany. Yeah. So, um, just being, you know, on the location of the Battle of the Bulge yeah. and talking about what was happening, and they were coming over this ridge, and <laughs> you could really visualize that. Yeah, you can visualize, and and so it becomes contextual learning, which is always better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that, uh, I think that take, my kids have all been very, well, I was willing, I've, I've been willing to take the kids out of school at the drop of a hat. Like I would always take one of the kids with me on, on my business trips, you know, and, and when they were 12, they'd get to come to Europe with me because you know, sometimes they'd have to stay in the hotel, but most of the time I'd take them right to the business trips. Yeah. You know, sit sit in the negotiations and that. And uh, I know that one time I was taking the kids to one of my boys to Japan with me, and uh, and they didn't know quite what to think about it. They thought that, that maybe he spoke Japanese and was a spy or something like that. And I said, no, I just want him to know what's going on. Yeah. You know what, what my life is. Yeah. And. Uh, and so that was uh, that was kind of a uh, uh, my attitude is that if there's something more interesting going on in the school, let's go do it. Yeah, yeah. Nolan, 
This has been fantastic. I really appreciate it. I know you have another appointment to get to. Where should we pe point people towards and what are some, what's a, some final words we should leave them with? Brainrush.com. Yeah. NolanBushnell.com. Yeah. Uh, my brain, my, my website. At Nolan Bushnell is my Twitter. Yeah. And, uh, and I, um, I don't Twitter as much as I should, but I do when I think I have something to say. Yeah. And, um, and if you're seeing this from Australia, I'm going to be in, uh, in Australia giving a speech, uh, at the end of next month. Uh, I'm going to be in Norway uh, a week before that giving a speech and, uh, up in Trondheim. And, um, uh, you know, I just, I'm, I'm building some really good s stuff, and you'll be able to download some new apps that will be fun to play as well yeah. as very learning. Yeah. Any final words, what people should uh, get out of this? I know I love the ending of your book when you talk about what you told Steve Jobs when he was asking about Pixar. Yeah, just do it. Just <laughs> Action. Yeah, act. Just act. Just act. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit like Nike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Change your life. Do different things. Mix it up. Um, every time I try something new and different, it engages me in a very powerful way. Yeah. And it turns out that there's some good brain science behind that. And plus, when you do different things, you create new dendrites and build your brain. You'll actually get smarter. Yeah. Nolan, thank you. I really appreciate it. Fantastic. Good fun. Awesome. Bye now. Let me move my screen so yeah. that I, I'm looking at you instead of off to the side. Sure. Um, You're I'm, so distinguished with the pipe and everything. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's my look. Like masterpiece <laughs> theater. <laughs> the uh, I'm looking. I'm working on an app that is. Have you have you played the room or room two, which is on the iPad? No, I haven't. It's, it's a it's a sort of a room escape kind of thing mm -hmm. on on an app, and I'm doing one uh, that overlays a knowledge of electricity. So once you escape the room, you understand the basics ah, of Ohm's law for brain works. rush, huh? For brain rush, is it for brain right. rush? Okay, yeah. But I I still like to design games. Yes. So you have like a, do you have like an inventor's like Thomas Edison space like behind you? I see a bunch of electronic there's light bulbs there's what's behind you it is uh it is my cave it's my uh, my kids said that if i wanted to i've got enough parts here to build a space shuttle <laughs> 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 I, I i guess i could turn a little more light on to if you'd like to sort of see a little more of it it's that works a, yeah yeah it's got all kinds oh of this is amazing stuff there tools. wow you could build a space shuttle what is that yeah yeah, it's anyway. It's uh, I've always had a cave, you know. Yeah. And and you know, in high school and what have you, my uh, my bedroom was in the basement, and I had it turned into a workshop and a lab. And you know, my sisters were all afraid to come downstairs. <laughs> just afraid they'd get electrocuted. <laughs> they probably would. Yeah, <laughs> I, I expect nothing less from you. I guess. Uh, what's a fun fact about you most people don't know? I've watched numerous interviews, videos of you. What's what's something people don't know? Oh, I don't know. I I, I think there are a few things. I'm I'm a big punster. Oh, you are okay. You know, and uh, my kids. Uh, I always start with a joke of some sort. Um, I. Uh, I snowboard. Really? Um, okay. I wouldn't have guessed that. <laughs> well, one of the rules in, in my family is that you have to be an elegant beginner. Okay. You know, that, that everybody, you know, there are a million things that you don't know, and, you, and whenever you start on something that you don't know, you're a beginner. Yeah. And you have to learn to do that with grace and aplomb sure. and not get so full of yourself. And so... We were skiing and the boys were snowboarding and they said, Dad, come on, you got to learn how to snowboard. You know, I was 55 years old 
and uh, you know the all the people who were snowboarding are all in their teens and early twenties, and right? What and and of course they started jazzing me about being an elegant beginner. So I said, okay, I'll learn how to snowboard, and I learned how, and, and it's fun. And when I'm with them, I snowboard, and when I'm with my wife, I ski. Nice. Um, and then, I mean, another fun fact I looked up that I don't know if most people know, you have eight kids, and that's remarkable. That's probably one of the most remarkable feats you have out of everything. Yeah, and it's actually, uh, I, I like to say that it's, uh, it's my best accomplishment. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I like, you know, like Brent and those guys, they all grew up with projects. We, had, we, were, we were a building, tinkering family. Oh, sure, yeah. And uh, always had a metal, metal shop and a wood shop and, uh, and uh, chemistry lab and electronics lab available to them. Yeah, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm.